Hello, my name is Rebecca Tapp and this is the DNA of Purpose podcast where we explore purpose as a part of who we already are. We showcase all inspiring stories of the most purpose-driven people on the planet with the intention of giving you the tools to step into the potential of who you were always born to be. After all, it's in your DNA. Hello and Happy New Year. For those of you who have been following the podcast for the last two years, I want to kick off the first episode of season three by saying I am so immensely grateful for your loyal following over the last two years. Without uh, our listeners and the incredible guests that we've we've had on this podcast, I'd uh, never have got to where we are today, a place where with my hand on my heart, I can share with all all of you, that our team are officially able to say that we have purpose decoded and that we decoded purpose in a period of time where the world really did change forever and where purpose has become both the anchor and the sail in a journey into the unknown. For all of those reasons, this year, our team have made the decision to change the name of the podcast from Decoding Purpose to the DNA of purpose. Why? Because in Decoding Purpose, what we discovered was that purpose was so much bigger than understanding what or why. Purpose was about who we are. It's who you are in any given moment, in any context. It's how you show up at work, at home, in in partnering or as a parent. It is your identity, your influence and your impact all rolled into one integrated expression of physical, mental, and emotional energy. We will, of course, still be sharing stories from the most purpose-driven humans on the planet, but our leading question is less about defining or decoding purpose, and we are so much more focused on amplifying purpose as a part of who you already are, past, present, and future, and giving you the tools to step into the full potential of who you were always born to be. After all, this is DNA that we're talking about. Now, a few quick updates before we dive into today's incredible interview with Eben Kirksey, who is the author of The Mutant Project, Inside the Global Race to Genetically Modify Humans where we will not only uh, learn about DNA and genetic editing or, or what is officially called CRISPR, but we will also chat about ethical, economic and environmental implications of such things. Yes, do strap yourself in for today's interview. But now for those updates. The first piece of really exciting news is that I'll be hosting a free webinar to empower you with the DNA of Purpose framework so that you can dive into 2021 more deeply connected with your purpose as a part of who you are. Um, I'm beyond excited to be sharing everything I've learned over over the past few years about the nature of purpose. So watch this space. The webinar is on the 24th of Feb and you can sign up for free at the website. Secondly, this podcast is now being filmed again. So exciting. And and honestly, it's also a level up for me in terms of stepping into my DNA of purpose. I'm learning as I go about the world of filming interviews, interviews, and so far I'm having an absolute ball. If you're a person who prefers video, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and of course, also this podcast so you know when we're releasing our episodes. Finally, this year... I'm also wholeheartedly stepping into my DNA of purpose. So what that means is that we will be doing a lot more events, free webinars, as I've mentioned, and we also have some really cool product launches coming up. So again, jump onto the website, which is www.rebeccatap.com. That's tap with two Ps, uh, or you can just pop my name into a Google so- search and sign up for our newsletter, which is Shots of Purpose, and that will keep you up to date with everything that is happening in our world. Right now, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the DNA of Purpose. 
Eben Kirksey, it is such a pleasure to have you on the DNA of Purpose podcast. I am so excited to have you uh, have you online here today with me. Yeah, thanks for reaching out. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, you're more than welcome. Now, as a starting point, it would be great to understand more about who you are. So I was wondering if you were able to provide our listeners with an introduction to your professional world, but also your purpose in in pursuing that profession. Uh, Basically, ever since I was an undergraduate, I've been trying to uh, integrate insights from biology and anthropology. I, I did a double major when I was a youngster. And, you know, really ever since I've been trying to sort of work out a connection between those two fields. And um, I've done a lot of different things. I've um, used art to sort of reframe encounters with science to bring scientific artifacts out of the lab and um, stage encounters with the public using things that people don't usually get to see. Um, I've also looked at... um, Uh, you know, the forms of life that are emerging in surprising places. So I've got a book called Emerging Ecologies that is about, um, you know, all the kinds of life that is is transforming the world around us, in part in response to human enterprises, but also making us do things differently. And, you know, with this book, um, in looking at CRISPR, um, you know, as we are entering this new phase of um, bioengineering, a a moment when we can sort of make conscious decisions about the future of humanity, about our own evolution, you know, I really think it's important for us to slow down and think about what values are at stake and whose ethics are going to govern this this future. Mm, Yeah, it's an an interesting uh, point in time because probably for the first time, it's become so important that we do become conscious of our evolution. Um, I imagine up until now with these emerging technologies, um, we have kind of evolved in in a reactive way and it has been quite an unconscious process where, you know, these new technologies like gene editing are certainly acting as a catalyst for, for great change in terms of how we view the world of evolution. In, in some ways, it's radically new because, you know, we're going into cells and, and trying to change the, the genetic makeup of individual genes. But in some ways, it's, it's really not anything new. So, you know, mm. this idea of eugenics has been around for a long time. Um, this idea of improving uh, genes, that's literally what eugenics means. You is good and eugenics is, you know, related to genetics. So, you know, with the early eugenics campaigns, you saw sterilization taking place. You saw the Nazi death camps. And and I I think, you know, that history isn't so long ago. The state of Oregon outlawed eugenic sterilization just in the 1980s. So as as we're thinking about these new futures for humanity, we've got to remember how it went wrong in the past and, and think very carefully about what we'd like to try to engineer into the future of humanity. Mm. And how do you feel you have fulfilled your purpose in the intersection of science, genetics, and anthropology? What's been unique about your journey? Well, what I've tried to do in this book is really explore this from the patient's perspective. So, Mm. you know, you get a little bit of the science, you you know, I go to the National Institutes of Health and take a course on how to use CRISPR and sort of shows the, the ways that it can be used. Um, But rather than just enter the realm of speculation with science fiction or, you know, focus too much on the details, it's it's really a patient driven story. So, you know, I focus on the lives of these um, two uh, children in uh, China, Lulu and Nana, who were born amidst this very controversial experiment where Dr. He Zhang Kui tried to engineer genetic resistance to HIV. I I also tell the story of lesser known people, um, HIV positive activists, uh, Matt Sharp and Jay Johnson and others in the United States who've been campaigning for innovative and risky medicine ever since they watched all their friends and loved ones die in the AIDS pandemic or epidemic that emerged. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's kind of a, a, a different book from many of the ones that are out there that are trying to just focus on ethics in the abstract or, you know, the science in terms of what it looks like in a a laboratory. I'm trying to animate these stories with, you know, actual people's lives, people's struggles over health and well-being. Mm. So you just, uh, you just mentioned Lula and Nana, and I'm really interested to unpack that story uh, a little more. Can you, can you firstly talk me through the significant events that led to the birth of Lulu and Nana? 
So, yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of different places to start. And maybe I'll just start from how I kind of um, fell into this story. So I was invited to speak on the ethics panel in Hong Kong at this summit where experts from around the world were coming to talk about in theory. Now that we have CRISPR and other efficient, precise, relatively precise, we can go into that. But new tools for changing DNA, you know, how should we use them? Should we use them at all? And, you know, as I was arriving there, checking into the hotel, I learned that there was this guy in the same hotel who'd just done the thing that everybody had been talking about. You know, it was the headline on CNN. People around the world were calling this monstrous. And as I dug down into the details of the story, I realized it wasn't the story of a rogue scientist, someone acting on his own. You know, this, this person, Hei Zhang Kui, who uh, did, did the experiment, was very much in dialogue with leaders of the field, people like Jennifer Doudna, who recently run, won the Nobel Prize, um, as well as many others. There's you know, a whole circle of trust of investors, of other scientists who were backing this experiment, um, as well as members of the Chinese Con Communist Party. So, so in part, I tell a story of you know, who gets to count as a scientific pioneer, um, who gets dismissed and um, labeled a rogue or a pariah. But it's also a very human story about the parents that signed up for this experiment. Um, so in China, uh, if you have HIV as the fathers of, of uh, all the uh, uh, couples that participated in this, there was a number of different people who tried to have genetically modified children, only two couples succeeded. So all the men in the experiment had HIV. And by doing this first in man experiment, they were trying to do something really banal, really simple. They just wanted to have children. And in China right now, you can't have children if you're HIV positive, if you don't want to risk infecting your partner. Um, you know, it turns out that uh, new science shows that if, if you just take your medicine, if you stay on stand, standard antiretrovirals, and you can basically reduce your viral load to undetectable, you can have babies the old fashioned way. But a few years ago in 2018, when this experiment was happening, that wasn't the medical consensus. Everybody thought that you had to use fancy techniques like IVF or a technique called sperm washing to prevent transmitting the virus to your partner or your children. So, so in some ways, this experiment was just trying to overcome a very social problem. You know, there wasn't a medical need for this experiment, but there was a social need in China. These, these men wanted to have children and they wanted to have children that weren't um, going to be subjected to the same sort of discrimination and humiliation mm. they had experienced. So if you have HIV in China, um, you know, you might lose your job if your employer finds out. So it, it was really just trying to, to protect these children. Um, but ironically or tragically, um, the children, you know, as CNN was calling this experiment monstrous, you know, by association, the children in the imagination of the public become monsters. Mm. So, so I try to tell their story um, to tell some unreported details of their story about health problems that they experienced at birth. They were, they were in the hospital um, when Dr. Hei Zhang Kui goes on YouTube and tries to explain this to the public. Um, Dr. He Mis misleadingly claimed that these two children were as healthy as any others. But in fact, they were born very prematurely. They were born at 31 weeks mm. and had to stay in the neonatal intensive care unit. So, so it's, it's a real, um, you know, warning to anybody who wants to try to venture into the domain of genetically modified children, you know, lightly. It, it's, it's serious stuff that we're talking about. And out of all the couples that went through these procedures, only one was, or sorry, only two were able to, to do it. So there were a lot of failed attempts along the way. So it's it's definitely not an easy thing to do. Mm. Now, you, you just mentioned that you'd checked into the, I think it was the Le, Le Meridian Cyberport Hotel in Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, super, super fancy hotel. <laughs> super fancy <laughs> hotel, super fancy name. And that was like the day after this news broke. When no, you, it was as the news was as breaking. As the news broke. So <laughs> yes. you were like right in the middle of really in experiencing between, the response yeah. of the science community as this was happening. When you think back to that point in time, can you capture for me how you felt and what your perspective was on, on what was going on around you? Well, it felt a little bit like science fiction had arrived in mm. reality. You know, for starters, in, in the initial moment, we didn't quite believe that it had happened or, you know, was, is this a hoax? Is this like, you know, some 
some report that can't be verified. But as the news sunk in, you know, a lot of us were just hungry for details. So, um, you know, we're all kind of living through this moment together. There are reporters swarming everywhere. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of conferences and usually it's, you know, a bunch of really nerdy people just, you know, <laughs> hanging out and eating danishes and drinking coffee. But this this was a charged event, um, you know, and even when they introduced him, I, I was speaking on the panel right after him. And, uh, you know, about we were all ethics of all subjects. About <laughs> ethics, right, right. So I had to, first of all, I had to figure out what had happened and, you know, give a completely different talk than the one that I'd planned for. But, you know, in the moment where they announce that he's about to come on stage, there was a pause of about, you know, one to two minutes. And we're all just looking around like, is he here? Is he going to show up? So, so it was really a moment of befuddlement. And um, to make matters even more interesting or surreal, you know, most of us were jet lagged. I mm. I'd just come in from California and we're sort of in this semi-conscious state between waking and dreaming and reality has just shifted. And, you know, as, as we're all trying to think about what had happened, um, yeah, it, 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 was, it was definitely a, a surreal moment. And um, I, I think in the moment, one of the things I was remembering is that, you know, really in some ways this wasn't new. So in California, I had just been interviewing some of the world's first edited people. And they actually had the same gene taken out of, of, of their genome as these two babies, Lulu and Nana. So Matt Sharp, who I, I mentioned ago, you know, he's this loud and proud gay activist who's subjected himself to something like 12 different clinical trials at this point. Wow. And, you know, I, I asked him, like, was it scary to have your genes edited? Like, what did it feel like when they hooked you up to the IV and let your cells drip back into your body? Um, he's like, no, I was, I was just, you know, he did it on a lunch break, basically. Um, so, you know, he, when I started to push him and say, like, wasn't this like a serious moment in your life? He's like, let me tell you, honey, about the thymus transplant that got in the nineties. <laughs> they like, you know, ripped a hole open in my chest and put this baby thymus inside. And there was some sort of wacky theory about how I'd get new T cells. Um, didn't work out. They ripped it out a few weeks later and it was just like a lot of blood so, so, so for people like Matt Sharp, gene editing contains a lot of hope and promise. Yeah. And at the same time, the company that did that experiment had some serious ethical missteps. The, mm. the company's called Sangamo, and they're basically pushing profit over patient health and well-being. So some of the same things that were being said about Dr. Hu in Hong Kong, I'd already seen play out in the US. And, and the book is really an attempt to reconcile that, this, mm. these, these two places where this cutting edge experimental medicine is taking place, but really, you know, it's not patient centered. It's, it's really about profit. And, and I think that's um, kind of one of the take home messages is, you know, who gets to control these technologies? Mm. Is it just going to be the big, powerful Silicon Valley companies or, or the companies in Shenzhen where Dr. Hub was working or are we going to have more egalitarian access to these kinds of tools? Mm, that's a theme I, I want to explore in more detail in a minute, but I'm, I'm going to backtrack first and um, give our listeners a little bit of a science lesson. Um, I'm just wondering if you can, I guess, give us a bit of an overview, firstly, around how DNA works, just in case there's anyone out there who doesn't, who doesn't really get the science to give those people an opportunity to, to catch up with a little bit of science communication from one of the best. Um, and then to also tell me a little bit more about CRISPR and, and gene editing. How does that work? So adults, uh, adult humans have about 34 trillion cells in, in our body. And each one of those cells has a nucleus. So inside of the cell, there's like this little brown bit in the middle. So you've got chromosomes packed in there. And each chromosome, if you unravel it, has these strands of DNA wrapped around itself. So you probably have heard of the double helix. That's that's these two molecules wrapped around each other. So the genetic code has four letters, A, T, G, C. And that code basically, it gets translated into things that, you know, you can see. Like, you know, if you change an A to a T, you can get blue eyes or not blue eyes. Mm. And, and that's just one very simple trait. Most traits are way more complicated than that. And it's not just a single gene, but it's a lot of different genes. What CRISPR does is that it goes into the nucleus of the cell. First, you got to get it there. That's that's a whole separate thing. And you know, part of the story is when you're talking about 34 trillion cells, good luck if you want to try <laughs> to change the DNA in every single one. So in part, this is why Dr. Ha did it at a single cell stage. If you do it at you know the single cell stage, the cell divides, and in theory, you've got a homogeneous critter. You know, you've got this, the the adult that grows out of that single cell 
is likely to pretty much have the same genetic makeup. Mm. It's way more complicated. I mean, along the way, we accumulate mutations all the time. And, uh, you know, we have about 30 to 60 mutations that our parents didn't have when, when we're born. I read as, that you were saying we're all yeah. mutants. Everyone is a mutant. mutant. <laughs> yeah. So in part, that's, that's where the title of the book comes but from. But I mean, you explained the evolution there, that we have all of these, um, you know, new, new bits and that we let go of some as well. Yeah. So as, as we age, we get mutations in our body and like an average skin cell, by the time you're, you know, middle-aged like me in your forties, you're going to have about 6,000 mutations in, yeah. in a given skin cell. Um, so what CRISPR does is produce targeted mutations. This, this is also part of the book title. So, you know, a lot of people talk about gene editing. So if I was editing something, you would expect I type a sentence, oops, I make a typo. I just back up my cursor and fix it. It's a lot more complicated than that. That metaphor for me doesn't quite work. Mm. So I, I like to use the metaphor of, of a drone, like, you know, the ones that the U.S. military has that like to, you know, shoot at terrorists. Maybe, maybe they're going to start shooting at white terrorists now. Who, who knows? <laughs> it's a new era for the war on terror. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes those drones take out the, the target and it's a nice, clean, clean, neat, precision strike but sometimes they take out the wedding party. So, you know, with CRISPR, you go in, you might be interested in changing a, a single letter. Maybe you want a blue-eyed baby and you, you change an A to a T and, you know, sometimes it works out, but usually it's more messy. You're going to end up taking out three letters or five letters or sometimes mm. 6,000 letters. Oops. Or so even much a whole risk attached to that yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. or, or a whole chromosome like a month ago. Yeah. So chromosomes are these huge bundles of DNA and a paper published, you know, a month or two ago showing that CRISPR can accidentally take out a whole chromosome. Whoops, I might have needed that extra chromosome. Uh, but it, it's really hard to, you know, you can't just magically conjure it back. It's not like you have the undo function on your word processor. Mm. These, these changes stick. And, um, you know, at this point, we don't really have the kind of, you know, software that would make that editing metaphor translate into reality. Mm. So... My next question we touched on earlier, and basically what I want to talk about is the fine line between innovation with a focus on purposeful human progress versus gaining power and profit as a part of the innovation economy. Now, firstly, from the perspective of positive human progress, what is the silver lining of CRISPR, of genetic editing? So what kind of diseases could be cured and how can we apply it to advance humanity? Well, for starters, I would say that there is a history of disagreement between the disabled community and the medical establishment about what constitutes a disease. So if you happen to be deaf or if you happen to be blind, you might like to have a child like yourself. And, you know, there's all kinds of very difficult ethical conversations that people are starting oh, to have. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, for, for the deaf community, they're saying, like, no, I would love to have a child like myself. You know, mm. it. it as this technology becomes more widely available, you know, am I going to be able to choose to have a child that's like myself? Could, could I even choose to have a child, you know, say you make a baby, make a little embryo, and you sequence the genes and learn like, oh, this embryo doesn't have deafness. Like, could I use, ethically, could I use CRISPR to quote unquote improve that embryo to make it deaf like me? Um, so, so, you know, there's a lot of other genes that you could get major um, changes uh, as a result of tinkering with. So say that you want a child that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger at the age five. That's possible. You know, you target the myostatin gene, you knock it out, you get this huge muscly kid. And you also get a kid that's likely to have heart disease when mm. they're old. Um, you could do the same thing for endurance. You could target EPO, which is something that Lance Armstrong and others have targeted using drugs, but you could make a permanent deletion to your child's EPO receptor, but your child's more likely to have a stroke. So, so I, I think as we're starting to get these tools that enable us to make these changes, we're starting to also realize how complicated genetics is. You know, back in the 90s when I was an undergrad, you would hear all kinds of wild things like, you know, the gay gene or, you know, the intelligence gene or, you know, all these kinds of the, the sports gene. You can get sports gene tests that are totally junk science and you can pay a lot of money to, you know, get some kind of random booklet saying, you know, help your child in this way and not in this way. You know, others are saying, you know, we have the music gene. Um, 
And it's so complicated. So, mm-hmm. you know, at this point, the technology is more likely to induce an injury to create harm than actually improve human health and well being. Um, that said, you know, I, I personally think that this experiment that was about, you know, creating children that are HIV resistant, that's, that's a really interesting use. And, you know, while there's great medicines that already exist, like if, if you're at risk of HIV, you know, if, if you're in prostitution or if your partner is HIV positive, you can take a drug called PrEP, but sometimes people miss a dose. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, good things that could happen if, you know, suddenly we don't have to worry about all the social stigma and all, you know, health, mm. health problems aren't, aren't so bad these days, at least in you live, if you live in the US or Australia or China, like we can get ready access to HIV medicine. It's really not a big deal like it was in the 90s. But imagine, you know, if, if you were positive as an adult, if you could, you know, change your genetic makeup so that you don't have this receptor that lets the virus get in the cell. And, you know, now we're talking a lot about ACE2, the receptor that lets coronavirus get, get in, you know, in this environment, who wouldn't, want, you know, like, sure, sign me up, get rid of my ACE2. But it, it's also really difficult, you know, like, again, as I was just saying, we don't really entirely understand the consequences of deleting the receptor that lets HIV get into the cell. Mm. There's, there's some indication that you're more vulnerable to influenza strains that are fatal, like H, H1N1 influenza. If that had gone pandemic, it, there's at least some evidence to suggest that folks without that, that receptor, they'd be worse off. So the rules of the game can change, you know, as new viruses circulate, mm. um, we really don't know what, what the future holds. So anticipating a future, you know, anticipating a future where, uh, you know, the future is not like the present, you know, we, we know this in a radical kind of way. Like if, uh, if we were having this conversation a year ago, you know, the landscape would be totally different yeah. and, um, you know, we don't know what's coming next. So I guess I'm, I'm a little pessimistic about, the imagining of, you know, let's, let's improve the human species. And in part that pessimism just comes from these histories of discrimination, these targeted, you know, death camps, the killings that targeted people with the wrong color skin, that targeted people who were immigrants from elsewhere, that targeted people who had the wrong religion or the wrong sexuality. You know, there's, there's ways that these kind of tools could, you know, make us all the same. You know, do we all want to look like Brad Pitt? Do we all want to, you know, it, it, so, so there's a way that if, if these consumer choices, like, do I have a child with blue eyes, blonde hair, you know, that's tall, mm. tall actually height, you're not going to have much, much luck. If you want a, a, a child that's super tall, you know, feed them hormones. <laughs> well, I read that there was, um, in your book, you were talking about the nature, nature versus nurture and that things that I would have automatically thought were, were all about our DNA, like our height are in fact, not really anything to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. if you look at the primary literature, I, I think it's something like 168 genes that are associated with height. And that only explains like a fraction of, of the heritability of height. So yeah. like, you know, drink milk with lots of, you know, from factory farms where there's lots of hormones <laughs> in the, in the, in the system. Um, there's yeah much more effective ways to have a, a, a taller child. If that's sort of your jam, you know, you, you could maybe get a, a six foot seven child if, if you've really tried hard with the right, you know, hormone supplements. Um, but, but again, you know, a lot of this has risks and, you know, we're living in an experimental moment and we don't really entirely understand, you know, there's so many synthetic chemical products around. And now as we're contemplating entering this realm of synthetic biology, you know, it's, it's really, um, some of the things that we can imagine about ways this might go sideways are, are easy to identify. So yeah. as I was saying earlier, you use, you use CRISPR, you want a blue eyed child and you end up with a child that's missing a chromosome, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's easy to imagine, but there's other ways that this can go sideways that are less easy, easy to imagine. So, so I guess, I mean, you asked me about, you know, what are the, what's the promise of using this for a better future for humanity? And you know, it's, it's, it's uh, genetics is so complicated that it's, it's really difficult. If, even if you pick like a single target or a single disease or a single mm-hmm. trait, you know, it, it's so complicated. Mm-hmm. So I personally, I'd rather leave it up to chance. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or, I mean, the next question underneath that then is, are these risks worth taking and will these big technology innovation companies take them anyway because of the profitability of this? 
So yes, and um, in some ways, CRISPR is no different from all the other very expensive technologies that people are being offered when yeah. they do in vitro fertilization or IVF. So, so right now, um, if you're trying to get pregnant, if you're having difficulty and you're using IVF, um, the, the gynecologist is likely, it, de- it really depends on which country you're operating in. Mm. You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, the UK, it's supported by health, healthcare, the national health, health system here in Australia, you have to pay for it. Same in the US, you can spend, you know, 20, 40, 60 grand very easily. And part of the things that they're adding on are things that haven't been properly tested. So there's a product called Embryo Glue that was never, mm. you know, tested with rigorous clinical trials, but the doctor is going to try to sell you that and say like, Hey, you know, this might be your last chance to get, to get pregnant. So we better throw some embryo glue in there because, you know, that might make it stick better. Mm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I was reading was, in your book that even IVF was a mistake, right? When it first. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, part of IVF. So IVF, that produced the first baby, Louise Brown, yeah. was very deliberately planned. And um, Steptoe and Edwards, the scientists behind that experiment, um, choreographed it as a publicity stunt. Mm. You know, they they had uh, reporters outside of the hospital. Um, so Louise Brown, the first person born by that technique, was a public figure, you know, at her moment of birth. Um, one critical part of the IVF procedure was found totally by mistake. So the iconic image that most people have seen of IVF is like an egg over here being held by, by a little tiny needle or pipette. And then the other needle coming in and puncturing the egg and, and squirting the sperm inside. That was a total mistake. (laughs) Some, some, some embryologists did it one day and they put it back in the fridge or actually the incubator. You want to keep them hot rather than cold. And um, the team that came in to implant the embryos the next day, the very first time this was done, they were like, Oh, that egg looks like it's better than the rest. Let's choose that one. Mm. And, um, you know, they stuck it in and it seemed to work. And, you know, one, one thing to take away from that is, you know, when you introduce new techniques into the clinic, often there are unintended consequences. If you're a girl and you went through IVF, it's, it's very like if, if you yourself are, you know, were, were conceived that way, you're probably not going to have bad you know, health outcomes as a result of that procedure. But if you happen to be a boy, um, you're likely to have male infertility. Mm. And um, one of the uh, experts on CRISPR and IVF that I interviewed for this book said, you know, that's a great business plan. You know, come come see us in 20 to 40 years when when you need to make babies. So, um, you know, some of these things about IVF, which which is a really important technology that's enabling a lot of people to reproduce and, and um, times when fertility is, is, you know, difficult as more of us are choosing to have children later in life. Mm. You know, it's a very important technology, but a lot of um, the doctors aren't being as ethical as they should in informing people about the risks and benefits and the limitations of, of what IVF can do. Mm. So I want to talk about um, some of the other, I guess, dynamics when it comes to CRISPR. Um, basically, I wanted to explore with you racial and economic disparities. So let's assume, you know, gene editing is being used to help someone heal from from some kind of life-threatening condition, you know, like cancer, as an example. Is is the technology readily available to all socioeconomic backgrounds? And, like, is there diversity in the research that is being conducted? The short answer is no. Mm -hmm. And... um, I experienced this in a profound way when I went to the the lab that's doing the first CRISPR clinical trial in the United States. This is at the University of Pennsylvania, and they showed me their Cancer Survivor Hall of Fame. And I walked in there and got to see all these people who had, you know, kind of laid everything on the line and battled cancer. Uh, This young girl, Emily Whitehead, is kind of the poster child of, of, you know, clearly the doctors had their favorites. She was the favorite. She was, she was, you know, I think uh, either six or seven when she received this, this life-changing gene therapy that, you know, eliminated leukemia from her body. And she's Mm -hmm. been pretty much healthy ever since. But the remarkable thing in that cancer survivor hall of fame was that it was all white people, except for one person. There there was one family, uh, Nick Wilkins, um, who was Asian American. So I ended up, uh, you know, delving deep into Nick's story, talking to Nick's mom, Lisa, and um, she told me how difficult, you you know, each, again, each country is different, but um, Mm. in the US right now, if you don't have health insurance or if if you have suboptimal health insurance, you know, these claims for cancer, if your kid gets cancer, 
you're basically screwed. Like financially you're screwed. And so she told me about how she and her husband are both accountants. Um, she kept working. Her husband resigned from his job so that he could full time battle the insurance companies and just work on these claims. So when she heard about this new gene therapy experiment, she was wondering, you know, am I going to have to mortgage my house for this? And this was a, a serious consideration. Um, thankfully, she was able to afford the treatment. Um, the company Novartis um, paid for some of the bills. Her insurance paid for the rest. She still had to come up with funding for transportation and housing. Um, but then, you know, after all this is done, after Novartis gets this therapy approved, it's the very first gene therapy approved in the U.S. and it's the very first one that's that's hitting the international markets. It's called Kimraya, and um, they put a price tag on it, and it's upwards of four hundred grand in, in the U.S. and and you know, these, these new therapies are not being covered by the insurance companies. So, okay, if, if you've got 400 grand, if you're willing to mortgage your house or, you know, go fund me, like good luck. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if you don't have those kind of networks or resources, you're, you're, you're going to die. And, you know, the stark reality of this is uh, also readily apparent in a place like Philadelphia where this trial was done. You know, I was staying in a part of town where um, gentrification is happening, happening very fast, where you can see just stark economic inequality in the streets. You know, some streets of Philly are just full of homeless folks, like lined up at night. You can literally just like stacked up next to each other. And, you know, people who can't afford housing security, people who can't afford, you know, basic medical diagnosis, like you're not going to get the cutting edge cancer treatment. You're not likely even going to get your cancer detected because you can't afford to have that, that early, early screen. So yeah, the ways that these gene editing technologies are playing out is radically exacerbating, like radically changing social and economic inequality. Not to mention, you know, one of the places I do research is Indonesia. So in places like Indonesia, many parts of Africa, you're lucky to, lucky to get an ultrasound exam much less, you know, some kind of fancy genetic test or some kind of fancy IVF procedure. So yeah, I, I really see a new era of, of inequality coming and one that is being increasingly exacerbated from, from not day one, but, you know, sort of nine months before day one, you know, people are able to get some kinds of people are able to get advanced medical care and, and others aren't. Mm. So I'm interested to know, in your in your opinion, what are the implications of um, CRISPR on both religion and politics? And broadly speaking, do you think that science has the power to flip traditional social paradigms or belief systems? I think this is going to be a really interesting one to watch. So, mm. so in the US, you know, the conservative Christians have lined up hard against embryo research. And at the same time, you know, some people suffer from congenital conditions. So, you know, there's certain metabolic diseases, certain cancers, um, all kinds of things that you might really not want to pass on to your offspring. And, um, you know, at this point, the jury's really still out when it comes to Christianity. Um, in doing research for this book, you know, I was getting inside of the really complicated religious traditions in China. Um, you know, so in theory, um, Chairman Mao got rid of religion, you know, with his cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. That was one of the aims. We're going to be a modern country. We're going to just be governed by science and progress. Um, but I really found that um, there were serious religious and ethical values that people were using to figure out how they felt about Dr. He's experiment, for example. Or there was an earlier experiment in China where they were doing embryo editing research. They were trying to change the DNA of human embryos but they weren't implanting them. So the Chinese public basically had no reaction to that experiment that was in a lab that didn't result in live babies, but there was a huge you know, public outcry about the birth of Lulu and Nana. And, and most of it, I mean, after the initial um, sort of wave of comments about it being monstrous and you know, questioning the humanity of these children, I started seeing posts on Weibo and WeChat. These, these are the social we, uh, networks, so, social media platforms of China. I started really, you know, just seeing a lot of concerned people. You know, where are these children now? Are they going to be subjected to lifelong surveillance by the Chinese Communist Party? You know, what what um, what's their future? What's their fate? And really, just concern for their well-being. 
So if, if you look at, you know, Taoist traditions, Confucian traditions, um, human life begins at the moment of birth. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that means that there's a lot of stuff that can happen before a child's born that, you know, where the eth ethical calculus is different. Um, but yeah, after you're born, you know, that's, that's where you really become a person in these religious traditions. So, so I think we're going to, you know, um, be asked to rethink our fundamental ethics and values as we're presented with new scientific realities. What, what I haven't mentioned yet are, you know, kind of the wild radical possibilities. You know, I've talked about athletic performance and, mm. and musical stuff. You know, green kids, totally easy. Like, I, I, with my level of lab skill, I could probably do it. Give, give me a, you know, established <laughs> clinic and a willing doctor, you know, we, we could hook you up. You know, there's, there's a gene um, that makes jellyfish glow green. That's it's insane. Really, yeah, yeah, we, that's totally <laughs> insane. <laughs> We've been doing this to animals for about 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, red, red kids, doable. Blue kids, easy. You know, certain, certain things are going to be really easy to do. And, you know, well, uh, I mean, many of us have tattoos that we regret, right? Yeah. So, um, and, you know in thinking about intergenerational ethics, not only are you thinking about the color of your children, you're thinking about the color of your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. What might look fashionable in 2021 might look really kitsch and, you know, 2070. <laughs> mm. So for, for you in your role, how would you define what it means to be human? Which I know is such a big question to ask you, but when you, when you consider using, you know, like data to change DNA, where are we crossing the line between what it means to be human opposed to what it means to be a robot or a cyborg? Or do you like when we're starting to bend those rules? How how would you respond to that? What's your take on that? Yeah, I'm really interested in blurring that boundary. And in part, it's you, you mentioned cyborg. So I was I was trained as a PhD student under Donna Haraway, yeah. who's famous in the 1980s for issuing the cyborg manifesto. So, you know, at a time when everybody was afraid of the personal computer, the internet really didn't exist yet, but people, you know, were afraid of these machine monsters. You know, now we're all carrying these little computers around in our pockets. Now mm. we're all, you know, embedded in these surveillance networks. Now we're all able to do we're, we're able to augment the human capacity so much, whether it's with our laptops or smartphones or, you know, these vast AI networks that are now, you know, changing how we move through the world. And, you know, I really think with the biological basis of humanity, we, we all also have to think about how it's, it's, it's not only um, being undermined potentially by our own technology in the present and in the near future, but how we're also the product of, of these, these exchanges and events. So, so my new project is about um, uh, the coronavirus and, mm. and doing some of the basic reading to understand how viruses work. I'm realizing a lot of us, a lot of our genetic material is actually viral. So if you do a whole genome sequence, if you sequence all the letters of DNA in the human genome, about, you know, depending on the estimates you use, it's about half, you know, about half to even two thirds have viral origin. So that's, that's kind of mind boggling to think about And this isn't just, you know, events in the past. Mm. You, you might've heard about how HIV has um, something called reverse transcriptase. So what makes it so difficult to get rid of HIV is that the virus enters you, it makes a copy of itself and it inserts itself into your genome. And actually our own bodies also have re reverse transcriptase. And there's viruses circulating all the time. We only have studied about 90, so 99.9% .9 of viruses are unknown. Mm. So there's constantly new genetic material circulating in our bodies and we're constantly, you know, modifying, being modified, not, not in a conscious purpose kind of way, but by other agents in our environment. So, so I guess in, in returning to that really big question that you asked, you know, what does it mean to be human? I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, those earlier encounters with other kinds of life that produce our current form. I'm also thinking about the microbes in our gut. So if you look at the microbiome, mm. you learn that, you know, the microbes in our gut that are changing as we eat different things, you know, they're secreting things like serotonin, you know, key receptors that change the way that we feel and think. So 
uh, I, I guess I like to see the human being as existing in relation. And, mm. you know, it exists in relation to these other kinds of life. It exists in relation to the technological products that, that we've made and that have changed us in turn. So rather than think about human evolution as, as something static, you know, something that just happened in the past, you know, the primate ancestors might help us understand mm. who we are. I'm really interested in the ways that technology, um, both, you know, computing technologies and informatics technologies, but also these biological technologies might enable us to embrace totally new possibilities. And, and here's where I turn to science fiction, you know, and, and I think some of the the feminist tradition of science fiction has really great classics. Every, everything from, you know, Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis series, where you know the, the future of humanity is is basically um, contingent on, you know, do we accept the fact that our offspring will be part alien? The, these aliens basically save us from our own destructive tendencies and, mm. and let us reproduce, but only if um, they mute certain genes and let us have some of their genes. Um, and then, you know, there's also uh, Vonda McIntyre's wonderful adventures uh, in a book called Superluminal, where she, you know, imagines what it might be to have gills and to be able to communicate with orca whales and go underwater. But then also the, the book really explores, you know, the difficult personal choices where one of the key uh, uh, orca people decides that they want to engage in space travel. So that means altering their body again and sort of distancing themselves from that other mode of life. Mm. So increasingly, I think we are gonna have um, opportunities to make changes that might not be reversible or that might be partially reversible to our bodies. And you know, if you go back to that tattoo analogy, we have to think very deliberately and very clearly, you know, do, do I wanna you know, be photosynthetic and soak up, you know, do I wanna be the new kind of beatnik, um, beach bum kind of lifestyle, you know, is, is that going to have some kind of stigmatizing, you know, if I choose to have green, um, you know, photosynthetic organisms in my skin, is that going to mean that I'm not going to be able to get certain jobs? Like we, we still are just at the early stages of figuring out what's biologically and technically possible, mm. but there's going to be huge cultural and social implications that, that we need to think through at the same time. Mm. And just, I mean, my my mind is literally um, like this is all mind blowing stuff, and um, you know, it, it makes me really consider our connection to human consciousness, and realizing that we are in a state of evolution, that we can change our bodies in in any number of ways. That actually, maybe to travel to out of space, it might be that we, um, you know, that our consciousness is placed in some other form of technology altogether, which um, a guest of mine had mentioned on on a, on this podcast, which is obviously a really extreme idea. But what I'm hearing from you is right now we are in a state of evolution. And that all of these things are, are shifting and moving anyway in in our in terms of our natural biology, but then when we look at something like our CRISPR, that just takes it to a whole new level. Yeah, if, mm. if you're thinking so, so technically, so I'm actually a historian of consciousness. That's my PhD. Oh, cool. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> okay, so I touched uh, on a good topic then. Yeah, yeah. Yay. It's, it's <laughs> I'm like, am I going too woo woo now on the scientist? Yeah, <laughs> no, but, but actually, people, this, so people who apply to that PhD program and say that they want to study the history of consciousness are rejected for being too literal minded. So, yeah. you know, in, in the tradition of Santa Cruz, which is where I got my PhD, uh, Santa Cruz, California, um, you know, the history of consciousness in part is in a history of ideas uh, program. And, um, you know, if, if you think about these evolutionary questions of the present through the recent past, you know, think about what print capitalism did to the human consciousness, right? So, so before you had the printing press, you had this wild diversity of languages. You had, you know, little linguistic bubbles that weren't talking to each other. You had ideas that were kind of trapped and bounded by, you know, just the, the, the network of contacts that were very local, just, you know, right around you. And that moment radically changed. That, that, that basically led to the formation of nations. You know, mm -hmm. some, something that wasn't imagined before suddenly became imaginable when you were all reading the same newspaper, when you were all reading the same books that, that were in your, you know, there was the German books and there's the French books and there's the English books. And this is what led to nations. And, you know, now we're in a moment, so that that's an easy example to think with because the, the printing press is easy to kind of hold on to. Now we're in a moment where we have, you know, all these different social media platforms where we have, 
you know, all these algorithms that are shaping how we think that are doing distributed thinking for us and with us, many of them trying to get us to spend money in certain ways. Like that's, you know, if, if you look at um, sort of AI and capitalism and surveillance, like there's ways that everything we are doing on Gmail or, or Google Maps, like this is fueling new ways of advertising, new ways of, you know, I, I, I remember the first moment I walked into a restaurant and the person knew my name, not because I'd been there before, but because a Google algorithm told, told them I was about to walk in the door. Um, so I, I think as we're thinking about the future of consciousness, you know, not only am, am I interested in the ways that, you know, we're cyborgs that, that, you know, our minds are mediated by um, what we ate for lunch and how that's being digested by the microbes, um, how, you know, we might be uh, starting to monkey with, you know, the genetics of neurobiology, which is a very poorly under, under, understood field, you know, um, if height is complicated, like good luck in trying to figure out, you know, all the different genetic mechanisms involved in how you think. Um, but, you know, there's, there's going to be some accidents and some of those accidents are going to be monstrous and interesting. So, you know, the concluding part of my book is basically all about embracing the monstrous and um, to return to the disabled um, question, you know, one, one of my key um, voices in the book is Gregor Wolbring. His, his body looks very different than ours, not because of some genetic problem or some mutation, but because his mother took a, a drug called thalidomide when she was pregnant. So his, his arms and, and legs look really different than the rest of us. And he says that he's very happy with who he is. He gets around by crawling and um, he has a wheelchair and has all kinds of adaptive technologies that let him in, interface with, you know, the, the built environment that's been built for bipedal, you know, the rest of us who get around with arms and legs. And, you know, his question to us as we're contemplating futures with CRISPR is, can we live with our mistakes? Can we live with the monstrous possibilities that this technology enables? You know, can, can a mother learn to embrace a child that looks radically different from herself? So I, I think as, as, you know, these new experimental horizons open up, we, we, we need to, I mean, it's, it's exciting to get, you know, the science fiction is great. And, you know, the dystopian science fiction that's mixed with the utopia, I think is the best kind of science fiction. But we also have to look at the recent past to, to realize, you know, we've tried out all sorts of other experimental possibilities and some we've discarded. Um, we've decided collectively, um, humanity has decided, you know, thalidomide, we don't want more babies that look like that. But again, you know, my friend Gregor insists, you know, I'm happy with who I am. You, you can treat somebody like me as an anomaly, as a monster. You can try to eliminate us from the population. But for, you know, for Gregor and for me, I, I see that as a new kind of human biological diversity and, and a new kind of embodied consciousness. You know, for, for me and thinking about consciousness, it really depends on what kind of form you have it, inhabit. Like that being and knowing to me sort of go together. Um, so yeah, in, in thinking about these these new futures of consciousness, I, I return to someone like Gregor, who's you know he's a university professor, he's a biochemist, um, he's a theorist of disability, and and I think a real prophet for thinking about you know what the future might hold. Mm -hmm. We are going to do a whole other podcast episode on that subject in the future. Great. Um, I want to talk about the implications uh, again for a minute of genetic modification, given we're already, you know, producing genetically modified animals, plants and organisms, which I imagine also influences the biodiversity of the environment. Um, what do you know about the impact on the environment when it comes to genetic modification, whether that be in our food or, or in us? What can science tell us about that? So I think in looking at those early GMO crops, um, we also have to hold science together with politics and economy. So if you look at Monsanto, you know, this was a big profit driven corporation that in many cases was putting new toxins out there in the genetic form. So when we had the first round of Monsanto crops, the promise was, we're gonna reduce pesticide use. We're, we're going to you know, make a cleaner environment. Um, uh, you know, at the same time, many people, many activists, um, including my friend, Mark Lyons, you know, were out there um, 
cutting down these plants, sort of uh, refusing uh, that fundamental alteration of, of nature. So, so Mark uh, has written a book about um, what he sees as the promise of GMOs. He, he's become a climate change a activist and kind of equates um, sort of the issues that people have with GMO foods with some of the climate denier, that anti-science movement. Yeah. For, for me, it's a, a little more complicated. Um, if, if you look at some of those Monsanto uh, products, you see that many of them have gone wild in, in horrible kinds of ways. Mm. So um, some plants that had um, in the brassica family that had genes um, uh, for resisting uh, glyphosate, this, this, this Roundup Ready uh, product that Monsanto has, they've hybridized. They've, they've, those, those genes have jumped around in the ecosystem. So now what you have are, are super resistant weeds that crop up in these farmers' fields. And to deal with those weeds, you have to find new, more potent, more toxic pesticides. Um, not to mention the fact that Roundup glyphosate is all over the place right now. It's in your body, it's in my body. And for those of us who've had really intense exposures, many are getting cancers. So, you know, the, the promise of genetic engineering in those early days, I, I think was, was kind of hijacked by these big companies. And, you know, I, I think there's all kinds of possibilities for more careful genetic engineering where it's not just about creating, you know, a more homogenous, um, uh, you know, soybean crop or corn crop that you can use these big tractors and big applications of, of pesticide, you know, this, this homogeneity of, of these different, not, not to mention that the food tasted bad, right? Like if anyone remembers the flavor saver tomato, it, it was this, this like thing that was supposed to have a lar longer shelf life, but it basically tasted horrible. I mean, man, many of these industrial potato uh, tomatoes are, are tasting really horrible. Um, but I think, you know, we're now in a new era where, these tools aren't being controlled by the big companies. So that's, that's for me, one promise of CRISPR or other, other techniques. Um, a pro so, so CRISPR is cheap and easy to use. You can, you can design your own genetic engineering tool, a microscopic little, you know, scissors, mm. if you like. And I know you for, did a course. I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's like a hundred, a hundred bucks to order your own, you know, it, it, there's a lot of equipment that goes along with it. And, and to really get, get something that's going to actually work. It's a lot of trial and error, but um, you know, it's, it's not just the big companies that can afford to do this anymore. So I, I guess for me, the question is, you know, can we imagine um, futures of genetic engineering that are taking the interests and needs of other animals and plants into mind? Can, mm -hmm. can we, you know, it, in part, it's like, can we change our own modes of being to, you know, not be so horrible and, and all the pollution and plastic waste and all the other things that we're generating with our current lifestyle. But can we also, you know, think about genetic modifications that might enable a better future for other species? And, and maybe one that comes to mind is frogs. So right now there's mass extinction happening in amphibian mm -hmm. populations. There's, there's a fungal disease, a pandemic fungal disease that has been killing off frogs. So um, there's about 6,000 known species of frogs the zoos have committed to save 10 species and um, about 3,000 species, 290 odd species. You know, the, there's, there's a critical need right now for new ways of dealing with this, this problem of mass extinction. So can we find a way to protect these frogs against the chytrid fungus? Like that's, that's for me an interesting genetic engineering question but also maybe a question of, you know, can we find symbiotic bacteria to live with them? Or, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to answering these kind of questions. So, so for me, the tools themselves aren't inherently evil or good or bad. Um, as I say in the book, you know, CRISPR has no power in itself. It has power when it's put in the hands of, of a, a, a human or, or a bacteria for that matter, mm. you know, that CRISPR started out as a bacterial immune system. So yeah, like how, how can we use these tools and to what purpose? Like for me, those, those are the questions that we should be asking about genetic engineering. Mm. So I, I want to share a little extract from your book. Um, in the book, you spoke about a gene editing summit in Washington in December 2015, where the ethical and moral implications of CRISPR were being discussed. Um, what you said in in the extract was a diverse group of people stood up to the microphone during the Q&A session later in the day with questions about this distinction. 
Parents speaking for children with rare genetic diseases demanded that the scientists and policymakers step on the gas, bringing embryo engineering technology to American consumers as fast as possible. Philosophers debated fundamental ethical issues. Should we have absolute liberty when it comes to choosing the genetic makeup of our offspring, or should society proceed with caution as we think about the rights of the unborn child? Now, I share that because I think it really captures the questions that sit in the topic that you've addressed um, in The Mutant Project, your book. Um, I think that this, yeah, this really captures the paradox. So as my last question, what, in your opinion, does the promised land look like? And when I say the promised land, the promised land being our ability to really act responsibly with the knowledge that we have and evolve accordingly in how we use this tool. I think the promised land involves people kind of taking these tools off the shelf and, mm. you know, repurposing them and in surprising ways. So I think there's going to be a tendency of the medical establishment to dominate this, this whole field. And, you know, if, if you don't kind of do your homework and you just go into your doctor and, and be like, all right, what's the menu? Like what's on offer here? You know, I, I really see the potential of a new era of eugenics where you know, the doctors are just going to make some kind of distinctions like, you know, this, this kind of condition is, is legit. This isn't. Um, yeah, I guess for me, the, the promised land is, is creating diversity rather than homogeneity. So, mm-hmm. so the risk, you know, with eugenics, are we all going to look the same? Do we all have the same dreams? Do we all aspire towards the same future? Or is there room with this technology to dream different dreams, to dream, you know, dreams that might seem abominable now, like in the 1980s, mm-hmm. the cyborg was this, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and half his face like gone and you see the robot underneath. And, you know, we were all collectively afraid of computers. And, uh, you know, there's, there's gonna be certain, as I, I said earlier, you know, mistakes made along the way that could open up monstrous new possibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of my disabled friends insist that, you know, we're better equipped to go to space than you are. <laughs> we're, we're used to breathing with um, these, you know, one, one, one of my friends, Alice Wong, um, has this really elaborate contraption that is over her face that she's constantly breathing with and she knows how to use it much, you know, like we'd be lost trying to, yeah. you know, navigate, like, you know, we're trying with masks, but it's not that, we're not that good at it yet. Um, so, so I think, you know, as, we increasingly venture into environments that are not like the one that we're currently in walking around as bipedal primates, like then we're going to see really interesting experimental possibilities. But I think if it's, you know, if we're going to use these tools to replicate the Nazi dream of the Aryan race, like if we're going to use these tools to create super athletes that might be really good at lifting a heavy barbell, but might, be in really precarious health situations, you know? How, how can we use these tools for the health and well being of humanity while embracing new forms of biological diversity? For, for me, that's, that's where the promised land lies. Love it. Brings a whole new meaning to diversity by design, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, even where can we buy this book, The Mutant Project? Where can we find uh, you? Where can we buy the book? I've just loved um, flicking through the pages, researching for today. I spent uh, spent hours, actually. I was just enthralled. Great. Well, if yeah. you're in Australia, for starters, support your local bookstore. Um, I've, I've been around many good local bookstores that have it on the shelf. Um, if not, or, you know, ask them to order it. Um, Amazon does have it. Um, you can get it on Kindle. You can get it as an audio book. Um, you can, you know, the UK edition is coming out in March. Um, so you can get it all the usual places um, but if at all possible, support your local bookstore. Yeah. And can we follow along on like Twitter or your, have you got your website? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and on my website, ebenkirksey.space. I'm about to launch a, a couple of videos and, and pictures. So, so you know, pictures really do say more than uh, a thousand words. So, you know, some of these spaces I visited in China have like reanimated woolly mammoths and like the place where Dr. Hug uh, did his experiment kind of looks like the Jetsons, but you know, there's no robots, but it, it's got the same aesthetic. So I'm um, coming very soon at eben.kirksey, uh, dot space or sorry, eben slash Kirksey or whatever that little line is 
kirksey.space, like that's where you can see pictures soon. And I will pop uh, that link in the show notes as well for anyone who who wants to follow. And I'm sure there will be be lots of people out there. Um, I have absolutely enjoyed every part of today's conversation. Thank you so much for joining me on the DNA of Purpose podcast. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. If you'd like to follow along, please do at the DNA of Purpose on Instagram. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is the DNA of Purpose with Rebecca Tapp. And if you'd like to keep up to date with all of our team's news and events, you can jump onto my website, which is RebeccaTapp.com. That is RebeccaTapp with two Ps.com. Also, if you love what we do, then then please do leave us a review. It would be greatly appreciated. Or if you'd like to share your inspiration with our team, we'd love to hear from you. Please do uh, reach out, say hi at your favourite social media hangout.